My name is Knut Ness. Currently, I work as a science communication advisor at BI Norwegian Business School. When I attended the conference, I was a research assistant. And my background is uh, Arabic and Middle Eastern studies and environmental studies. So firstly, I, I decided to study a non-European language. I think that was the beginning because I wanted to learn how the world looked from a non-European perspective. But it might easily have been Mandarin or Russian or Japanese. Uh, and I have an aunt who worked in the West Bank, so I was exposed to Arabic through her. So I guess if you put two and two together, that's why uh, I started studying Arabic. Well, I was interested in water. I think I'm, I'm interested in power, as in who makes the decisions and how are the decisions made. So it's the same reason why financial markets are interesting, right? Or economic models are interesting, uh, because it seems to be a place where power is concentrated. I'm interested in where the decisions are made. <laughs> And water is one of those areas, especially in Egypt and the Nile Basin. Uh, I mean, the Nile is one of the most important things to certainly Egypt, but also Sudan and to a lesser extent Ethiopia. If you want to have an impact, it seems to be wise to try to aim towards where power is concentrated. What I looked at is how important people, as in ministers and experts, and in Egypt and Sudan, legitimized the kind of uh, Egyptian and Sudanese official views of the Nile. That's what I did. You can't live somewhere without kind of noticing the political climate, right? And I mean, I, I arrived first in 2010 before the 25th of January, and then I don't know, it, it was an autocracy, right? And then I was there after during the Morsi, and then it felt kind of slightly more relaxed and freer, at least to me. Uh, and then it's closed down again now and after the coup. I was only there for two months or so, and I was there just the summer of 2013, just before the coup happened. It's a weird story because I wrote uh, applications in Arabic and sent them to people who seemed interesting. And one of the people I sent them to was a former minister of water. Uh, and surprisingly, he read it and surprisingly, he contacted me back. Yeah. Uh, and he invited me for a meeting um, and then he suggested that I intern with the National Water Research Center. It's a research arm of the Ministry of Water and Irrigation, which was interesting, but I was told to leave shortly before the coup in the summer, which I, I don't know, if, but I, I don't know, I guess it would surprise me if that was a coincidence. It's a challenge, but that doesn't necessarily make it negative, right? I mean, to some extent, it's easier to see see things as, as an outsider. To some extent, I mean, some things are easier to see, some things are more difficult to see. So I'm not working with it now anymore, for the time being at least. Uh, we'll see if I if I return. Um, but either way, if I if I were to return, it's important to learn the language very very well. <laughs> And it's important, I think, to try to see things from from the domestic perspective and not from a foreign perspective. I mean, it's it's no good traveling around and applying Norwegian perspectives to everything. I think the challenge for me or someone else working in any foreign context, but in this case, Egypt, is to become literate in the language and in the culture and and try to kind of see past your own prejudice and 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 ideas and and be open to 
I mean, it's the same. If I go to the US, I can't apply Norwegian perspectives in the US either, because you have a different culture in the US or in the UK. I mean, it, it it's, yeah. Because people in different disciplines spend all of their time looking at tiny, tiny things uh, and not being aware of the bigger picture. I was just working with a paper now by one of the researchers at BI who was writing about uh, two different schools of project management studies. And they both study projects, but they have completely different definitions of what a project is. So they ostensibly study the same thing, but actually they study different things and they don't speak together because they're both kind of ab absorbed in their own realities. So that's why it's, it's, it's important to bring people from different disciplines together. People from different religions need to see commonalities, right? To get to know each other and not be prejudiced and all that sort of thing. Different national backgrounds or whatever, the same thing. My instinct would be to come at it from a very kind of pragmatic and constructive perspective, which is that if it actually can help facilitate constructive action, then it's worthwhile, right? It's not yeah. more complicated than that. Any Anything helps. So if you have people who believe and um, appealing on the basis of Abrahamic religion is constructive, then then it's helpful, right? The diversity of people, I very much enjoyed the diversity of people because I, I come at it from an instrumental perspective, as I say, where if it helps, it's valuable, but the point is the end result. I don't know, it was a, a learning experience, I guess, that's the cliche, but you know, it was a privilege to be present and, and um, I'm not used to engaging with people who are actually religious. It's interesting to listen to people talk about something which is in a kind of uh, intellectual realm that I'm not familiar with. So the value for me, I'm very secular in my, my outlook. Uh, living in Norway and growing up in Norway, it's very easy to dismiss religion as irrelevant or worst case scenario harmful. I have many friends who would consider religion to be um, kind of destructive force, right? best case scenario irrelevant and i think that it's good to be exposed to people who are religious to see that that is a kind of an uh, irrelevant view to hold I, my, I did my master's in culture environment and sustainability so it was very kind of culturally focused right it's very focused on culture it's very kind of anthropological in approach and it's very it's very kind of bottom up and activism and all of that sort of thing there seem to be a lot of people who talk about the challenge with scaling up how you scale up change and how you scale you know change in action or how you scale up co2 cuts and all of that and the obvious answer to me is if you want to scale stuff up you need to work with business and the market the market is a machine for scaling things up. So if you want to actually have effective change, then then the way to go about it is through business and the market, right? So that's how you do it. So I hear a lot of the, you know, the greenwashing and all of that. That's all valid criticism. But it's I don't think it should be used to dismiss. I think it should hold to accountability and all and all that. But I, I think that, that business can be a tremendous Tremendously, well, it is a tremendously powerful force. And I think that if you actually want to create a more sustainable world, then you need to cooperate with it rather than kind of point fingers or worst case scenario, kind of isolate it or consider it to be irrelevant. Certainly in Norway, a lot of people seem to, well, at least some people seem to think that as, as soon as you start working in a corporation, you turn evil. Or as soon as you start talking in a, uh, working in a corporation, you, you start only caring about money, which isn't true. I bet you'll find people in BP or wherever who care as much about the environment as, as I do, certainly. There are good people 
there as well. So you find ways to work with them. There seems to be a lot of fatigue with capitalism and economics, which I can kind of understand, but which I think is I don't I don't think that's the I don't think that's the right way forward to be dismissive of it.